Generosity comes in many forms. Our time, our help, our kindness, and our resources. But here's what we know the Bible teaches us. When God's blessing comes to us, it must also go through us. So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? A timely gift? A helping hand? An act of kindness? Prosperity isn't meant to raise our standard of living, but to raise our standard of giving. Abundance isn't meant for us to live in luxury, but for us to help others live. And generosity isn't just something God wants from us, but something God wants for us. When Jesus came to save the world, he didn't ask, what can I spare? Instead, he asked, what will it take? So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? Amen. Generosity. We're going to look today into 2 Corinthians. If you would have your Bible, you want to open up, it's in chapter 9. We're going to look at chapter 9, uh, verses 6 through 15. A little bit of a word from the book of Proverbs as we think about generosity. We, we started that last week. We looked, at, uh, we looked at part of that, and we began this thought from, from Luke. And here's just to set your frame your mind with this again. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For the standard of measure, it will be measured in return to you. So we saw that and we began to think this thought about generosity. Today, we're going to hear more about generosity from the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church at Corinth. And here's what this letter encompasses many things. But chapter 8 and 9 specifically deal, both chapters, with this thought of generosity. And here's what's going on in their world at their time. The church in Jerusalem had run up on really hard times. They had great need within that church. The Apostle Paul's out traveling all over <clears throat> all over the area, and he's preaching the gospel, and he, he's pretty far away from Jerusalem, and here's what he's doing. He's beginning to share with people about the need and encouraging them to be generous. He's encouraging them to be generous, to give back to the church there in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting about that is many things, because primarily the church in Jerusalem was a Jewish church, okay? It's primarily Jews who had been saved, and the churches out where Paul's that was primarily Gentile churches. So there were the Gentiles giving of resources to the Jews. Now, I know they're all the body of Christ, but in their day, there, there was struggles with things like that, okay? We have struggles with things even like that in our day where we see different things. Paul is talking to them about this place here of generosity, and he's going to talk to them about that and what that looks like and what that feels like. So in light of what I just said to you, I want you just to listen and look at chapter 2, verse 9. I will read 6 through 15. And just listen with that in mind. Here's what he's going to say. Now, this I say, the Apostle Paul says, This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountiful will also reap bountifully. Each one of you must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. 
while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing greatness of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now I want to flip back into the book of Proverbs and let's listen to Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25. Solomon wrote this, There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results in only want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Father, thank you for allowing us to come into this place today and to worship you. As we have sang just a few moments ago, God, you are good. And God, and you have saved us and brought us to a place of of knowledge, a place of truth, a place of being indwelt by and hopefully filled with your spirit. God, that today we can know the joy that comes from being a child of God, the joy of being called a friend of God. I pray right now for every heart, for every person in this room, God, as we sense to feel your presence, as we sense to hear your voice, God, as we come before you, as we have read your word that the Apostle Paul has written to the church at Corinth, God, I pray, speak to us. Speak to us as never before. May generosity, God, be the norm. May generosity be the the tool that guides us. Thank you. Bless your word now. In Jesus' name we pray. Generosity. Here's, we kind of give a little bit of a definition. Okay, just a a definition. I want you to hear again that definition. We added just a little bit of a a piece of that for this week. So generosity, if we want to have a definition for it, defined as this, being kind, as being understanding, not selfish, with a willingness to give money, time, and energy to help meet the needs of others with no material benefit for yourself. There's generosity. It's godly generosity. Being willing to say, I will give of my time, I will give of my energy, I will give of my resources to help other people, to help Christians, to help non-Christians, to be about the work of God, the spreading of the gospel. And he just, I will have a generous heart about me because I want to be able to share in some of this goodness that God has brought about that he wants me to give and, and to share into the lives of other people. I made a couple of notes. There's had thoughts. Generosity is not something we do. Generosity is just who we are as Jesus followers. Generosity is a way of life for Christians who understand the grace of God. When you understand the grace of God, you're going to know this place of generosity. John 10.10, we know that verse. We talk about it uh, a lot. We hadn't as much lately, but Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He is a giver, a giver of life. As we sang the old rugged cross, and my mind can't help but see that image of Jesus walking up to Calvary, carrying that cross, willing to give his life, willing to give his all in the moment, giving the shedding of his blood so that we could know salvation, so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could have the promise and the hope of heaven. But even know this, even so that we can live life, L-I-F-E, on this earth, and know this place of what it means to have life. My pastor was named Roy Pledger. And Roy Pledger used to have this thing he would say. And I was just a kid, you know, and I would listen to this and I'd go, huh, that's just interesting to me. But he would say this. He would say, you know, being a Christian is so good. I would want to be a Christian even if there wasn't the promise of heaven at the end. And I'd just go, wow, how does that work? Because, you know, we think about heaven, we think about eternity. We all want to go there. That seems to be the goal of the most. He said living out his life on this earth was so blessed in him and the life that God shared in and through him that heaven would just be the icing on the cake. And I went, that's a pretty awesome thought. I think that's something we need to think about because sometimes I don't know that we all experience that quite so well. So I had this thought in the midst of all this as we're thinking about generosity as we think about giving and I just kind of wrote down this sentence and and to me and I don't want to make this sound bad an analogy but it's like generosity is a fringe benefit of being a Christian I want to think about that just a minute 
Being, having, knowing God, the generosity of my life is a fringe benefit of being saved. Because I'm saved, I get to have this benefit thing called generosity. And the thing is, most of us don't really know that. Most of us don't really use that because for whatever reason, we haven't ever really had to. And it's not something you just by nature gravitate to. But when you understand that and you begin to know that, you begin to live out some life in this way of generosity. Now, I begin to think about that. It was like this. The second place I went to work when I got out of college was called Norton. It was a company that made uh, industrial products. And when I went to work there, they gave me a salary. And I got that salary every week. And that was all cool. And they gave me fringe benefits. Okay? And I went, that's cool. Uh -huh. You know, I got some paid vacation. And I got some medical insurance. Back in that day, the company paid all of it. It was free. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, top of the line, good stuff. And that's no, that's fine. I never had to use it. I was young. Didn't really even matter. And then Zach was born in 1986. And Zach was born with, with the birth defect. And immediately he's carried to Children's Hospital. And all of a sudden, you know, we get a bill in the mail. We open it up. One line item was $74,000. 1986, that was a lot of money. You know, we don't seem like as much money now. Still a lot of money to me. But, and I'm just going, I'll never pay that back the rest of my life. I mean, you know, this is not going to work. And all of a sudden, I get the letter from Blue Cross that says, all charges approved, all paid, deductible, zero, all done. Got another one, $47,000. And I just went, Thank God for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. Because <laughs> I've got some fringe benefits. Do you understand that? I want to tell you something. Generosity is like fringe benefits of being saved. Amen. And you don't even know you got it till you use it. And when you begin to use it, it becomes one of the most awesome things you've ever seen in your life. So here's what I want you to think about. The Apostle Paul is talking to this church. And he's trying to get them to understand something. Use the generosity that God has given to you. Bless somebody else with the blessings which you've been blessed with. They had some material blessing in that church. There, there was well, Corinth was a wealthy city and there was some, some wealth there and there was some money there. And he wanted them to understand you're supposed to share that with some other people and some, have some generosity about you. So as he writes that, we're going to look at this and we're going to think about this just a minute, okay? We're going to look and we're going to see about three or four things that I'm just going to tell you it, it, generosity brings about. And, and if you hadn't got it, here's the goal in this, is to help you live life with a sense and a heart of generosity. The generosity that God has placed already within you if you're a child of God, so that you can express that to change the life of another person, change the life of other people, and in the process, you will receive something back from that that you don't even know, you don't even realize, that you're not even aware of. So here's, here's the thought. I just wrote this down. Four truths of generosity. The first one in verse 6 through 11. And here's just a thought. You'll see it. On the screen, generosity will allow you, get this, to experience God's blessings. That sounds simple. Generosity is going to allow you to experience God's blessing. And some people say, well, I already experienced God's blessing. And to some degree, maybe we do. Maybe there's some degree, there's something beyond that. We're going to look at that and think about that for just a minute. But I want you just to listen to these words and think this out. Generosity is going to help you experience God's blessings. And there's three things that he says in here in these verses that's kind of like just plain old principles. You understand me? Just a plain old principle. Just a principle that if you just kind of plug it in, you don't even have to understand it. It just works. Now, I've been trying to think about that in a way of a principle. He said there's principles. And I was thinking yesterday, I was in my office and I studying a little bit, and I come in and I flip my light switch on, and thank goodness, light come on. And I reached in my corner, and I flipped another button, and another light came on, I can see. You know, and I thought, I don't know how that works. I thought about it out why, because Al knows how that works. He's an electrical engineer. He understands that. I don't understand it, but I know how to flip the light switch on. And when I flip the light switch on, I get some light. Generosity here is going to help us like flip this light on and see some benefit, okay? Understand that. Listen to verse 6. Now, this I say, 
He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Here's the first principle. There's a principle here. Just call this the principle is increase. The principle of increase. We reap in the measure we sow. Generosity is going to be known in your life by the measure which you sow it. It The way you sow it is going to be known. The farmer who sows more seed is going to get a bigger harvest. That's just the way that works. The more you invest in the work of the Lord, the more fruit will abound to your account. Whether you're giving financially, whether you're giving service, whatever you give to, the more you pour into that, the more you're going to know back from that. The more you're going to realize that. Now, I want to qualify this. I believe, first and foremost, is that we're supposed to tithe. We give 10% of our increase to the Lord's work. And then generosity comes over above that. Generosity is giving even beyond that for us. And so here's what we can know is that as we sow, he says, then we're going to reap. As you give, as you give, as you share the blessings of God, there is going to be in return a blessing of God back to you. Now, here's the thing. It may not be in the same currency in which you give. You understand what I'm saying? Because there's currencies. We think a currency is money. But there's currencies in the kingdom of God. I may give a financial blessing. I may give a material blessing. I may give time of myself. I may give energy of myself. And I'm going to reap back from God that and more. But it may not be I give a dollar and I get two back. It may not be I give some time and I get time back. You understand me? But here's what he's saying. Here's what he wants you to know about generosity. There's a principle here. It is called increase. If you sow, you're going to reap. It's a given. That's the deal. It's a given. If you sow, you're going to reap. Verse 7 says, But one must do just as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. I always like that verse. It's just a powerful word to me. And here's the principle behind it is intent. Intent. Because here's what it says. Do as you as purposed in your heart. Purpose there means motive. It's the motive. It's the intention. It means to bring forward one's intention. So what he says there, I want you to understand there's an intent behind what we do. The intent in this generosity thing is not give it to get it. It's not to do something so that somebody will say, Whoa, look at old Joey. Didn't he do that? Didn't he awesome? Look at that. Didn't he do that? The intention is, is not going to be one of selfish nature or to be known. But he's going to say, do as he's purposed in your heart. And then he says, not grudgingly. Don't be sad. Don't be a, I just termed it, don't be a sad giver. <laughs> don't give and go, well, I had to. Don't come to church and go, well, I went today because I had to. You know, my wife, she just wouldn't shut up. <laughs> so I just had to go on. I went on to keep quiet. You know, this makes for peace in the family. It's just easier if I just go ahead and go. So I go. There's many ways we look at that. But what he's saying is don't be grudgingly in what you do. And then he's going to say this. Don't do it under compulsion. Don't be under compulsion. Don't do it just out of pain, annoyance. Don't be mad about what you have to do. But here's what he says. A generous heart. And it's a cool word. Cheerful giver. You know what the word cheerful, if you look that up in Strong's Concordance Dictionary, or you ever how you look that up, you know what the word is translated? You know what the word is? Hilarious. Hilarious. It means we ought to be hilarious about being able to give ourselves to God to help other people. We ought to be hilarious about getting up and coming to church on Sunday because I can bring an offering to God, an offering of my means, an offerings of my time, an offering of my, my resources, a, a, a first fruit of my lips unto Him. I can bring that in. We ought to be, when we understand what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, when we get a picture of God's grace for us and we can understand what that did for us, where we are in this moment and what that's going to mean to us for all eternity, that we're going to stand before a holy God, absolutely complete holiness, pureness, and we're going to stand before Him and all that we feel like we may be and we're going to see Him and all we can say is, God, have mercy on my soul. And all that's going to matter is that we have faith in that moment in Christ. And what we do... I'm going to tease you. When we understand that, 
when we know that there ought to be some hilarious giving of our lives to God in that moment. When we see that, we should want to know that. We should desire that. 8 through 11 just says this. This verse blows my mind. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always having all sufficiency in everything. That you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he who scattereth abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for the sowing and increase of the harvest of your righteousness. Now listen to this verse. And you will be enriched. And you will be enriched in everything for all liberality which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Now, here's the principle. And I just call this immediacy. Immediacy. There is, I believe this, in our lives, there is when we truly bring forth some generosity from our heart purely to God, is not going to have to plant some seed and let them grow. Look what he says in these verses. It's amazing. God's able to make all grace abound to you, having all sufficiency always in everything, as abundance for every good deed. He supplies seed. He makes it multiply for the sowing of increase of the harvest. And you're enriched in everything. And here's what he says. And here's what he's going to say. When you get this, you're going to live blessed. You're going to live some level of enriched. So, this happened to me this week. And I, and I, just, I, I struggled whether or not to share this. And anyway... I feel like I'm supposed to share this. In the, in, in, through the week, this week, well, first off, I had $100. I keep $100 stuffed in the corner of my wallet, way back in the corner for emergencies. And I've learned now uh, not to carry a lot of money with me. I've never carried much money with me. Back in my early days here, honestly, I mean, when people would come and, and, and need something, I'd just give them my money. Because I just, the way I was, I'd just give them my money. And so I learned, carry less money in your wallet. You better off. Just don't carry quite as much money. Well, anyway, I kept 100 stuffed in the corner back away if I knew anything. This week, through the middle of the week, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, God reminds me, you got $100 in your pocket. Yeah. And here's what he said. I want you to give it to somebody. And I'm like, huh? He said, I just want you to give it to somebody. And I said, okay. Who? And he said, I'll show you. Who's it? Who's it? Okay, so through the week I'm going about and milling about, and in, in the course of that I encountered a person. And when I encountered the person, immediately God said, "They're the one." I said, "They're the one." He said, "They're the one." So anyway, I went in my office and I sat down and I wrote a note, stuffed a hundred dollar bill in it, wrote the person's name on it, and then I dropped it off and just said, "I don't know. You'll understand it when you read the letter." Okay, so in a lot of that, <clears throat> I'm just going to share with you immediacy. This is kind of cool. So, three hours later, I get this. Thank you. I don't have the words at the moment to explain how I feel. Just know that it meant more to me than you can imagine. God always knows what I need when I need it the most. It's not even the money that brought tears to my eyes. It's just the thought of being appreciated. The devil always tells me I'm not good enough. But today, God let me know that I am. Thank you. And I went, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know what I mean? That is awesome. So here's what I'm going to say to you. In in these three things right here, generosity allows you to experience God's blessings that's beyond what you may even think they could be in the moment because he wants to do something greater. And we need to get this. We need to have some kind of place of some kind of vision for our lives in the area of generosity. We need to quit thinking, what can I get? What can I get? And we need to flip that and say, what can I give? What can I give? Because I'm going to tell you what, I believe this. That could be life-changing to us. So, wow, what three verses? Right there, 8, 9, 10, right in there. Powerful verses. Paul is trying to teach them about generosity. Here's the thing. Are you enriched? Do you feel enriched? Does life seem to suck the life out of you more than it does replenish the Spirit of God within you? 
I want to tell you something. Generosity flips the switch. Flinerosity is a benefit given to us by God that moves us, that changes us, that takes us from being doubtful to, to take us to being a person of greater faith. That takes us from being weak in our heart to being much in strength and encouraged in our heart because it takes the focus off of the gist of us and places it on blessing another person in the name of Jesus. Amen. Generosity. I don't know. I think there's something to this. He says in those verses, sufficiency. You have sufficiency. That means you already have in you Everything you need to be generous, you already have it. And most of the time we go, well, when I get it, I'll give it. You already got it. You already have whatever God wants to bless somebody else with inside you. And when you communicate that, when you share that, when you give that, I want to tell you something, you're able to know greater. The blessings of God in your life. That's a principle to me of generosity. Verse 12 says this. For the ministry. It's interesting he changed that. The ministry of this service. And he's talking about giving. He's talking about a giving of an offering to them. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints. But is overflowing through many thanksgiving to God. Generosity will help meet the needs of others. It just does. Generosity helps meet the needs of others. Paul kind of broads the terminology here. When he says that word there. When he uses the word ministry of this service. He's using a term that comes out of the Old Testament. That was used when the priest would make a sacrifice. Of an animal to cover the sin of people. He's using that word there. This ministry of service. And he's putting giving. The gift that they was going to make to them. On the par with making a sacrifice. For the life of someone else. He's comparing that. So what he's going to say is. Whatever that gift is. Whatever that is that God has placed within you. That you are willing to share. Is like a, a, a gift you give. That's going to help meet the needs of, of, of other people. And he wants us to be able to know that. And to see that. Giving. Really. Touches the lives of others. And meets that need. This happened a few weeks ago. I shared with you last Sunday about what we had done as a church, you know, to help the church with the air conditioning. The, the deacons agreed and the leadership time agreed that as we learn of these things, we as a church would be willing just to help somebody else. So just a couple of weeks back or so, I was in a meeting with, with two other pastors and one of them was the acting missions director for the association, it's Chris Johnson. And Chris Johnson just shared a story with me about a church that he was working with that was in a bind. That was in a bind. They have a small loan, not a big loan, but they have a small loan on their property. Through COVID, the pastor had left. The church is low, and they make interest payments every month, but they make a principal payment on their loan once a year. It's coming due to September. And they didn't have the money. And they had already been told, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to pay the principal loan on this loan. You're going to have to pay your portion of your payment. That's just business. You know what I mean? That's just where they're at. Well, when he said that, just, and then he talked on a minute, and he said a few things, and he said, first, we're going to help. He said, our church is going to help. And I just said, we'll help too. I know, we'll just help. So the bottom line of that is we were able, as a church, not something we say a whole lot about, we're able to actually make that half a principal payment on that facility for that church. And here's the thing. It simply does this. It meets the needs of other people. And in this case, <laughs> keeps a, a church in the community going Amen. to help support them. Now, that's just awesome to me that we have a, a thought about that, that we're willing as a church to be able to do that and to spread that out and to share that with people. So here's what he says in verse 12. Generosity simply says this. Supplying this Meets the needs of people in the moment or where they are and what they need. Man, generosity does that. And we need to have that heart, that place of generosity to meet those needs. Verse 13 says this, Because of the proof given by the ministry, by this ministry, giving again, they will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ. Just 
simple statement. Generosity in your heart. Generosity in my heart brings glory to God. Simply. We probably don't even ever connect our generosity and the glory of God. But Paul says this. When you're generous, when you're generous and you're willing to give, I want you to understand something. He says, that brings glory to God. That makes people be aware. Glorify here in this term is to celebrate and to honor someone who happens to be Christ. Celebrate and honor Christ through your life by the helping of other people. Now, that's an awesome thing because we need to get that part of a, that understanding of generosity because we said that in the beginning. It helped meet the needs of others without a material benefit for yourself. But you want to help that because that is a means by which to glorify God. We think about glorifying God when we come to church and we sing a song, you know, and we raise our hand. Or we think about that in an act of service in some kind of way. And we never, just think about this. This place of generosity, this heart of generosity helps glorify God and help meets the needs of people all in one. I was reading this and I was reading through different stuff and I read a story about that part of, of glorifying God. It was interesting to me. And it went like this. It said there was a, a wealthy Christian businessman who every day had daily devotionals with his kids. And they would pray for people. And he would teach them about praying for people. And every day they had some missionaries that they prayed for. And they prayed for them. And they thought about that every day. And then he had, a, one of the, he had three kids. And one of them, the youngest one, was like six years old. And one day when they finished praying for him and everything, the, the little fellow looks up and he said, Hey, Daddy, I got an idea. He said, What's that, son? He said, Give me your checkbook. And I'll help do what you just prayed for. <laughs> oh, that's just good. That is just good because sometimes we think about some things, we talk about some things, we might even pray about some things, but then when it comes down to it here, he says, when we give, I mean with some generosity, I'm going to tell you something, we can know and experience and bring forth the glory of God, the glory of God in a place, the glory of God among people. 14 and 15 says this, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Man, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Generosity. Here we are. Generosity unites God's people. Look, look at what that verse says. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, this is the people that he's wanting to send the resources to. Yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Generosity creates an environment where there is a great sense of unity in a family, in a church unit, because you're saying, I we want to do something for somebody else. We want to go beyond ourselves. We want to, and here's the deal with that. It's one of those things where God works. When we do that, God draws us together like this pulling of, of a net together and drawing us closer together. Because when you know this, there's a sense of generosity. I mean, I'm willing to reach out and I'm willing to go beyond myself to help somebody else for something greater than myself. Do you understand that? Generosity, it's the coolest thing, creates unity in a body of believers. Because all of a sudden they see something that they've never seen before. They feel something they've never seen before. And when that happens, you know, you have people who say, you would do that for me? You would really do that? That touches my heart. That draws us together. And then Paul can't even stand it. He just says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I mean, that's just a whole, that's just a whole sermon right there. Indescribable gift. God has given to us an indescribable gift. And we don't even know how that gift's going to play out all the way to the end. We don't even grasp it. We don't even realize that. We can't even imagine that. Years ago, at the turn of the 19th century, and there was a man named Podorowski. Some of you may know him. He was a piano player. He was like the awesome most piano player in the world. He was born in Poland. He could play the piano unbelievably. 
he began to travel all over the world and play the piano. He was in the United States to play the piano. And it was two college kids who had a bright idea. We're going to hire that guy to do a concert. We're promoted. And the profits off of it will help pay our tuition because they had started to school at Stanford University, even a prestigious school, 100 plus years ago. In the process of doing that, the man who handles the bookings for Podorowski said that'll be $2,000. $2,000, 120, 30 years ago, was a crazy lot of money. You know what they said? No problem. People will pay. We'll do it. The bottom line is they booked it. They put it together. They had the concert. They took up the money. Everybody loved it. It was awesome. And you know what? They took up $1,600. The two young guys go, oh, what are we going to do? So they took it personally to Mr. Podorowski with a note that says, here's $1,600 and an IOU for $400 and we're going to bust it till we get you the money. Here's the coolest thing. He tears up the note. Hands them the money back and says this. Go pay all your expenses. Give me 10% of what's left over. You guys keep the 90. That's pretty awesome. Good guy. Podorowski becomes the prime minister of Poland. And then World War I starts. And Poland is starving to death. Literally starving to death. They have no food. And there was a man in America named Herbert Hoover who was not president yet, but he was over a relief agency who knew Mr. Podorowski and he got all like millions of dollars worth of food and got it to France, got it to Poland, saved those people. Podorowski says, I want to meet the man who did that. So he travels to France and meets with Herbert Hoover. He said, sir, I cannot thank you enough. I don't know why you have helped us. And Herbert Hoover said, well, you don't remember me, but I was a young college student at Stanford. And you did that concert for us, and you give us all the money back. I'm just trying to pay you back a little. Generosity, I'm going to tell you something, has a way of going places. We never know it'll go. And it has a way of coming back in ways we'll never know it'll come back until you reach heaven. Some of the reward that you're going to know from some generosity that God wants you to share today, you will never know till the day you stand before him. That's awesome to me. That is awesome. Listen, here's what God is saying to us. Here's where he wants us to be. Understand the heart of generosity. Understand how God wants you to be with your money, with your time, with your resources, and with all that you do in life. Don't look at it as little compartments. Look at it as this, as we said last week. God owns it all. It's all His. What does He want me to do with that? And to give, to touch the lives of other people, to bring about what only He can bring about. When He touches people's lives through you, through a hand of generosity. Let's pray.